Oh, right. We are on the air, and so we will begin, which means that I have to put my glasses on. Uh, well, ladies and gentlemen of the Park Board, it is wonderful to see you in person. Um, this is, for some of us, the first time we've seen some of these people in person up here behind their nameplates, and it's great to have this really be back. So with that, I'm going to start the Thursday, December 8th Spokane Park Board meeting. And uh, all members are present. Nick Sumner is on the call. And Sally Lodato is absent excused. She's under the weather today. We wish her well and a speedy recovery. A lot of things going around. So any additions or de deletions to the agenda? Any public comment? I don't see anybody necessarily. No public comment. All right, we'll move right to the consent agenda. Ladies and gentlemen of the Park Board, you see six items in front of you on the consent agenda. Is there anything you wish to be removed for discussion? If not, I will move that the consent agenda be passed as presented. Is there a second? I'll second that. Thank you, Jerry. Any further comments? All right, all those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Oops, I, th I think that Nick meant aye for passing. Yes? All right. Because yes. Was, yes, because he would have said nay otherwise. All right, just timing. So, um, and notice you didn't have to raise your hand because you're here. So, all right, <laughs> special guests. No special guests. Mark Buning. Mark, are you up there? There you are. You're on the screen. Very good. Yes, hello. Good afternoon. I feel left out. Everybody's down at the City Hall. Let me uh, share my screen. He should. He should. All right, so here we are. We're starting out with the, with the fun stuff today with the financial report. So here we are, it's already November, uh, presenting the November financial report. Um, before we actually get started, I'm gonna you know, again reiterate a lot of the same information. We're seeing the same patterns in November uh, as we've seen a lot of the most of the year. Um, the current financials are, you know, as you all know, are compared to a budget based on a two-year average, and we know the last two years have been uh, not typical or atypical with lower levels of both expenditure and program revenues generated. And we will see here in this presentation the 2022 actual expenditures and revenues will will be presented as being significantly higher than the than the two-year average. And again, this reflects a much more typical year as we as we uh, have presented a much more normal year as we have in in before COVID. So, looking at our first slide, and again, I'll I'll click through these pretty quickly. And if there's any questions or comments, please just interrupt. And um, otherwise, I'll I'll move along. Uh, I'll just move along these slides pretty, pretty rapidly. Um, in this first slide, we see a comparison of actual 2022 expenditures uh, compared to the, uh, the historical two-year average. And we see again that the year-to-date expenditures are significantly higher than the budget average. Um, but again, I wanted to remind everybody this includes the $1.25 million that was transferred to Fund 1950 for Parks Capital Repair uh, replacement and capital, our capital program. And if this, if that transfer is factored out, the 2022 expenditures are above the a a budget average by about 23% or about $3.5 million. And again, as I mentioned earlier, this reflects a much more normal level of parks program activity. Our second slide, uh, we see our uh, year-to-date revenues compared to our historical budget average, and our actual revenues exceed the average by about $3 million, or about 18%. And compared to last year, our 2020, 20, let me start that over. Compared to last year, our 2022 revenues exceed the 2021 revenues by about $1.8 million. Our third slide here, we see a comparison of our actual revenues to our actual expenditures. 
uh, we see that total revenues exceed total expenditures at this point by about $235,000. Um, if the $1.25 million capital transfer is factored out, the year-to-date net revenues, that's revenues minus expenditures, is about $210,000 less than in 2021. So um, without that transfer, um, it's, it's actually quite comparable to, to last year in many respects. Any questions about the park fund before we look at the golf fund? Okay. Looking at the golf fund, um, in this slide we see that the year-to-date expenditures are above the historical average by about 13%. Actual operating expenditures are about $78,000 more than last year, reflecting a lot of the inflationary increases in labor, fuel, and fertilizers, and, and actually an increased maintenance expenditures. And the year-to-date debt service payments on the SIP loan uh, used to upgrade the irrigation systems are about $200,000 higher than, in, than last year. Um, and capital expenditures on necessary renovations are up about $400,000 over the same time in 2021. So some of our additional or extra fund balance we've been investing back into the, into the Gulf Capital uh, Program. On this slide, we see our actual total revenues um, are above the historical budget by about $230,000. Total revenues now, and again, this includes the SIP funds, total revenues exceed the 2021 revenues by, about, by approximately $306,000. And our last slide, we see a comparison of total actual revenues to our total actual expenditures. And we see total revenues exceed expenditures by about $1.5 million. And, you know, again, I want to mention this does include the facility improvement fee. And overall, the total year-to-date net revenues is about uh, approximately $168,000 less than at the same time last year. So that concludes the financial report. Are there any questions or comments? All right. Thank you, Mark. Thanks, Mark. Appreciate it. I just have one comment. Yes. I would really, I, this was a really short turnaround time again, and I, once again, I want to hand it to Parks Accounting, who had all the items booked and everything ready to, to run the reports to, to, create, to pull this all together. So thanks again to the, to the folks in, who are diligent and on top of things. So. Especially during the holiday season yes. with everything else going on. Especially during the holidays. Yes, so. thank you very all much. Right. Thank you very much. All right, Mark. So for special discussion or action items, a discussion item, Mr. Garrett Jones has the floor just because he wanted to stand up in front of a yeah. full park board and talk to you. <laughs> Where's the mouse? Right, right there. there. To the right of you. Oh, boy, we're starting to laugh. <laughs> wow. 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 We're helping. He was just teasing. <laughs> There we go. That looks appropriate. Yes, it does. <laughs> Thank, yeah, yes. <laughs> thanks for being here. All right, so I'm going to give a, a brief update on where we're at around the Expo 50 Partnership Opportunity Initiative. And briefly, before um, I go into this slide of really some more in depth goals of what we're trying to do around the events, I just want to give an overview breadth of what we're thinking moving forward into 2020. So the, the Expo 50 initiative involves representatives across a variety of local 
agencies and organizations to develop a plan that celebrates the 50th anniversary, but also where are we headed the next 50 years. In addition uh, for the celebration, projects involve long-range partnership plans involving stakeholders from the downtown core and around the community. And what we did is we set it up into what we call our, our five pillars. And those include the infrastructure and amenities, the funding and government structure, the Expo 50 events and special activities, marketing and branding, and then the connectivity, mobility, and walkability of our downtown and the river corridor. And really the overarching goals to this is, is bringing the community together to celebrate and reflect on those accomplishments from Expo 74 and what that brought for the renovations of our downtown since then, and then also where we're headed as an organization in this city. Also add permanent amenities and activities, one-time events, special activities that give everyone an opportunity to engage. Uh, provide and, and, and also provide an opportunity just for the community to celebrate. I think in these times, anytime we can have an opportunity just to come together for something positive, we need to really enforce that and celebrate that. And then also when we look at it, this is a partnership and this is what we call the 12 core partners of this organization that is helping not only for in-kind and their services and staff, but also a funding model running in from 2023 into 2024. And those include the City of Spokane, the Parks Department, Spokane County, the Public Facilities District, Inovia Foundation, Greater Spokane, Downtown Spokane Partnership, the Spokane Sports Commission, the University District, Visit Spokane, Gonzaga University, Avista, and Kindle Yards. And a part of this too is really reflecting on the investments too of what the river means to us in this community. And a lot of this is putting the river at the, at the center. Uh, historically, the river has been a boundary, and now we really truly need to embrace this, the river being the center of our community. And then also activate the river with additional amenities, and then also acknowledge the three kind of distinct districts that we have within the downtown core. So just imagine from Division Street Bridge to Don Cardong Bridge, that's more of that kind of upriver, a different feel. And then you have the urban core, the falls, and then you have the Great Gorge from Monroe Street Bridge down to Sanifer Bridge. And so it really puts that focus at the river being the center. And then when we look at the events, let's see if I can get this out of the way here. The goals for this, one is we cannot do this alone, and a lot of this is we can't do it and put the attention as full-time staff with our other duties, we need help. So, a part of that is developing a guide for a program manager, and so we're working right now on leads with, in partnership with Visit Spokane and other partners to bring in a person and an individual and a team that can really focus on this initiative 24-7 moving forward. And then also another goal is focus on the committee and the community's attention to collecting and developing content, making the biggest impact over a short period of time. A lot of discussion in this, how long? How long do we want to spread this? And, and through the committee work is really having an impact, a start date and an end date. So one, the community doesn't get burned out and, one, and also creating that excitement and dynamic event opportunities within a shorter period of time. So you come downtown, you come into somewhere else in the community and there's something different happening. Also create events and frameworks that are supportive of obtaining sponsorship and marketing objectives. This is a big one as well. Mm -hmm. Uh, we want to take away those barriers from the community as far as a fee-based activity, so we need those sponsors and those corporate entities and organizations to help us and assist us. And other considerations too, when we look at you know, a local versus regional uh, initiative, is to justify travel. So this is a big piece for some of these organizations of bringing people into the community. And then also we want to take away that fear of missing out from community members. And so giving those the flexibility and the opportunity to be able to uh, enjoy what we have downtown and within Riverfront Park in this community. And then also look at the, the, uh, the historical context of what Expo was and how we want to celebrate that from a, a static standpoint and then also a dynamic standpoint. And then also looking at the kind of the clientele of where the nostalgia piece of it, we're probably looking at a older demographic but at the same time, we want to educate the younger demographics of 
what this was, what this means to us, and where we're headed as a community. The event structure, move this a little out of the way here. Um, here's what we're thinking as far as dates. May 4th, 2024. So this will actually be the date of the 50th anniversary. This is the day before Bloomsday, 2024. Mm -hmm. And then running through July 4th weekend, so that'd be July 7th, 2024, because uh, July 4th is on a Thursday, so running that time, time period. And a part of that is concentrating the activities Friday through Monday to encourage an extra night stay from a, a regional tourism standpoint. And then st the stretch goal is a nine weeks, and within that nine week period, having 153 events within that. And looking at within those nine weeks, each week we have what we call an anchor event. And a lot of that too is what we have our legacy events, you know, Bloomsday, Hoop Fest, Fourth of July, and looking at having once a week that anchor event with this, uh, the supplementary events that go around it as well. And then we looked at two to four themes per day, and I'll get into the, what we're thinking for the themes within this nine week period moving forward. And then a lot of this should be reoccurring as well. And then also it's just self-navigating. This doesn't need to be something that you actually have to come down to an event. There's something that you could come down to and enjoy, learn, and engage with, and, and, and be able to be a part of this experience. And then also um, events each week should touch each theme at least once is what our thoughts are. And these uh, themes that we're th looking at right now is arts and culture, so that's a celebration through food, dance, music, and expression. Environmental stewardship, we do not want to lose the theme of Expo 74 and where we're headed as a community. Uh, recreation and sports, another big anchor of what makes Spokane special, is so really focusing on that healthy living piece of it. Uh, tribal cultural uh, component, and then the Expo legacy piece of this as well that will be a part of the nine weeks. And then this is just a, an example of what we're starting to do and as, far, as, a, as far as an event calendar of really trying to uh, identify what those particular anchor events, looking at what potential conflicts, you know, we don't want to oversaturate the region with certain events, so finding that combination there and then and that's where our partners at Visit Spokane, Downtown Spokane Partnership and others are a critical part of this partnership. And then milestones moving forward. Uh, one piece that we're going to do uh, in this partnership is come out with a community and volunteer survey. So asking strategic questions of what you would like to see, what makes Expo special, what events would you like to see within the downtown or in the community, and also with your response, you're basically also kind of volunteering your time as well. So we're gonna, we wanna have that volunteer base. We wanna have those ambassadors mm -hmm. that not only have the historical content of what Expo was and could ask questions, but also are excited about the recreational component, the cultural component, and we actually see feet on the ground in the downtown to help activate the space. And then come up with a diverse targeted outreach plan to groups and activated those theme categories, a sponsorship outreach, and then the event planning and facilitation. You know, some of the concerns too that we looked at when we looked at capacity, so this has continued, um, you know, questions or concerns that we have as far as hotels and, and finding that balance and not oversaturating uh, the community. Really trying to focus too on those targeted audiences, so what can we do for the younger generation, the older generation, and everyone in, in between, so really strategically looking at how do we get everyone to be able to be in, engaged in this. And then also um, looking at several big and non-related already attractions scheduled to take place. Again, this is looking at how do we work together communication to make sure we're not stepping on each other's toes and that we're putting our resources in the right places. And I'm gonna give you just a snapshot too of what we're looking for when we talk about a program manager. And, and this is really the, the face and the voice even though there's a lot of support behind the scenes. A lot of our event specialists within Riverfront Park are going to be a part of this. Um, we're also looking at other temp seasonal volunteer opportunities as well. But this person is really going to coordinate and activate events and, and help fill that calendar and be that, that point person that can get taken the questions and, and put those organizations in the right places. So not necessarily putting on the events, but 
making sure that we're outreaching to those organizations to fulfill those calendars and utilize our space. Sponsorship sales and in-kind services, also coordinate volunteers, um, and then coordinate group planning efforts and scheduling and group meetings, uh, sponsorship activation, coordinate the brand and merchandise and working with those other legacy organizations. So Bloomsday or Hoop Fest, that everyone has this feel when people are coming in that it's the 50th anniversary of Expo. And so we're really looking for somebody that has that experience in those areas around fundraising, event coordination, and having that broad spectrum of contacts and being able to juggle a ton of balls because we know when the survey goes out, everyone's gonna have a great opinion or idea <laughs> of what should happen. And so it's gonna take somebody to coordinate that, communicate that, and fill that calendar moving forward. So we have a couple leads. Um, I can't announce anything yet, but hopefully within uh, the next month, we plan to have somebody on board uh, starting in January is our, our goal. Visit Spokane also put in for ARPA funds with the county and was successful for 450000 uh, as seed money to start the marketing and event coordination around this. And we'll also have some additional dollars, 120000 per year for all the 12 partnerships coming together. We'll be in additional seed money. And then also part of the cultural event uh, initiative that the council passed with using ARPA money of potentially utilizing a portion of that to help support this initiative moving forward. Yes, sir. On the 120,000, is that 120,000 per 12 or 10 grand? 10 grand okay. per organization. For So 20 grand total mm -hmm. per organization, but 10 grand each year for 2023 mm -hmm. and 2024. Well, it's exciting to mm -hmm. see the plans developing, yeah. and um, I know lots of us have lots of ideas. So whoever this is, they're going to have to be Superman or woman, um, but they'll be well supported by staff. We believe there's a unicorn out there. So We believe we're, yeah. we're, oh, that's we're right. <laughs> our unicorns. Very good. All right. That's well, exciting. Interesting to see. How much of the uh, cultural events ARPA money are you going to be asking for? Uh, all of it. All of it, I bet. No, I bet. I'm kidding. Uh, <laughs> you know, in, in some of the conversations, me as a starting point, we were thinking around 50, 50,000. I think what the goal out of the cultural events is really taking that barrier away from organizations, right? So during this time period between May and July, our goal is, I don't know, all fees within Riverfront Park, but having, so it takes away some of the financial barrier. We want to take a, we want everyone to be able to have an equal opportunity to utilize Riverfront Park and our spaces downtown. And so taking that mission too from that cultural event and taking some of that barrier away financially, I think would be a huge benefit. Yeah, I think it would be good too though to get out in the neighborhoods, uh, neighborhood parks, yep. not just have it all happen downtown. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah, I think too, Gary, what really stood out for me, and I know it dates me, but uh, Expo was self-navigating. I mean, it just, there were so many different things you could select or choose from, and it was for all ages. And so I think because of the time frame that we're working in, you know, especially with the July that framed time for kids, you know, uh, and different ages, but that um, I really appreciate that piece. Yeah, absolutely. No, Greta? we're we're excited. Did you have a question, Greta? No. Okay. All right. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Jones. Thanks, Garrett. All right, with that, we'll move right into our committee reports. So, Kevin Brownlee, it looks like your meeting was canceled, but do you have anything to say? It was canceled. I would only add that our next meeting is January 3rd at 415. All right, that was quick and dirty. Okay, <laughs> uh, golf, Jerry Sperling. Uh, golf was canceled also. It's a little uh, <laughs> white out there. Uh, <laughs> so, anyway, uh, but that isn't stopping us from being uh, open and active in golf. So all the courses, and they're all different, so you need to call the clubhouse, but uh, simulator golf is happening at all of the courses. Um, and it's usually within the confines of the clubhouse. And of course, every clubhouse offers different, you know, little treats and that type of thing during uh, the week. So I would suggest that uh, for you out there who are viewing, uh, you look us up on the web and uh, make a phone call to the clubhouses. So anyway, uh, with that, we are all set ready to meet in January on the 10th, which is a Tuesday at 8 a.m. And it will be in the tribal. 
And often there are donuts, but <clears throat> I won't uh, say that. That's you know, I was also to take donuts today to Park Ups because we were going to start the policy oh, uh, meeting. Donut and policy. And that kind of got changed a little bit. So some other time. I had to eat them. All right. So <laughs> all right, Greta, Land Committee. Uh, land Committee met on the 30th, I think it was, and we had three action items, I believe, uh, two of which were on uh, the consent agenda, and one which we decided not to take action on. Um, <clears throat> we had a discussion of several items, one of them being the status of a, a policy to evaluate proposals for land use partnerships and land, land leasing agreements, and we, we had two discussion items that ended up being related to that policy. And one of those items was a, we had a presentation from the tribe about a partnership they're interested in with us in Highbridge Park. Mm -hmm. And um, we also had a landowner that wanted an easement across some of our property. Actually wanted a couple easements across some of our property. And both those to me kind of illustrate the, the wide range of things that this policy that, we're ho that I'm hoping we come up with mm -hmm. will, will cover. Yes. Um, and we got an update on dog park next steps. And we got an update on ETM consultants work on implementing the master plan. So it was a very interesting land committee meeting. And our next, which I'm sure will be equally interesting, will be on January 4th at 3.30 on WebEx or the Sister City Conference Room at City Hall. Okay, thank Thanks. you. Land Committee always has interesting things going on. Mm -hmm. uh, Recreation Committee meeting was canceled, and uh, their next meeting is going to be January 4th also, but at 5.15 in the Sister City Conference Room or virtually via WebEx. All right, now, uh, Riverfront Park Committee. Nick Sumner, anything to say? Hi, yeah, we did meet, yeah, we met. Um, we had a couple action items that were on the consent agenda. Uh, John was out and not available to us, so it was a relatively short meeting. Um, our next meeting will be on January 9th. And there continues to be a lot of things going on in Riverfront Park, winter markets, and of course skating on the ice ribbon, some of it to music, but it's a great place to come down and bring your families and share a little holiday cheer. So, all right. Finance Committee, Mr. Anderson, you have an action item. I always have a lot to say, I guess. Yes. <laughs> uh, the Finance Committee met Tuesday, December 6th in the hybrid format. Finance does have one action item regarding dedicating the West Canyon Drive as a public road. And this is such a unique process um, that we really didn't understand what was going on at times. So we uh, wanted uh, Nick to make the presentation to the entire board tonight. So Nick, take it away, please. If you didn't understand that, I don't know if we're gonna get there. Right now. No, but we'll try. No. Very interesting. It was. Can I just say this is an awesome pleasure for staff to see you all here. This is really <laughs> exciting. It's kind of kind of fun. So welcome. Thank you for having us. Um, let's see. We are going to share a screen. I gave Garrett a hard time earlier. I know. I, I think you need to make that smaller. <laughs> now, Nick, and I'm being a lot. And help him find the mouse if you would. <laughs> I'm just glad it isn't me. So minimize, <laughs> try to minimize that screen that you're on there. Oh, I thought you were joking. No, I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> He's very much right. <laughs> exactly. All right. So the Canyon Drive resolution. This is a non-binding resolution related to Canyon Drive, which is come to find out for the Parks Department. It seems to be a public road, but is actually considered a private road for the Parks Department. And so we'll walk you through exactly what and where this is. Um, so West Canyon Drive is going to be over by Indian Canyon Golf Course on the western portion of the city, actually just outside city limits. Um, Canyon Drive actually connects from Greenwood Drive or Greenwood Road, which is on the north side of the screen here, south past Indian Canyon Golf Course, which is this lighter green, to <laughs> Assembly, which takes you out to Sunset Highway. Um, if you're familiar, when I was a kid, you went out to the airport this way, you went to the dump this way, you get, this is uh, one of those scenic bypass kind of cut off roads. Government Way is going to be right on the, the, the eastern side of the, this, this road. 
So it's about a mile long. It does provide access to the Mystic Falls Trailhead, which is a part of Indian Canyon Natural Land, and it does provide access to our maintenance shop, and it does provide access for the couple of thousand folks that drive through that area every day. Right now, that's closed. Um, that was closed in late, oh, mid, no, mid to late November by the Spokane County uh, due to the condition of the facility. It's just a dangerous road to drive on. It's difficult to maintain in the winter. And so it got to the point where the road surface is so poor that for the safety of the people driving on it, the county felt the need to close that road. So it is currently not open to the public. This is an image of Canyon Drive. If you're going up from uh, the north, heading south, you could go up to Palisades if you stayed right at this Y. You could go left, and you could go up to Indian Canyon if you're familiar. That's my, my sketch of where it's closed there. Mm -hmm. um, the road itself, this is a general sense of what the character of that road is like. You can't see the potholes here, and I, I swear this image is from like five years ago, because if you've been on it lately, there's hardly, a lot of, hardly much pavement left. It is a county road, essentially, how it, in terms of its development. Um, this is our access into the Indian Canyon shop. Right now, our staff is actually taking barricades, moving them out of the way, driving into the shop, and then putting the, the barricades back every day. So they're, they're moving through that as needed. Um, this is a section of the, the road as you get to a hairpin turn that is the sort of impromptu trailhead for the Mystic Falls Trail. Um, if you're familiar with that area, there's a lot of hikers that come through this area. Um, and they also come down off the top of Greenwood Boulevard parking area. More road. Um, if you're just past Indian Canyon Golf Course coming from Sunset Highway looking north, so the opposite direction, this is where it's closed from the south. It's just past that Indian Canyon Golf Course driveway. Bonnie Drive, which takes you up to Rimrock and some of the homes that are in that area, it remains open. So the road itself is, is shut down. Um, what's the history here? From what we can tell, and we've been putting our historic preservation folks to work over the last couple of weeks and digging through our documents, this road, the land that this road sit on was purchased by the city between 1913 and 1930, little bits in 1913, and then big bits in 1930. Um, we have photos back from about the 20s that show it as a road, which is kind of cool. There's, a, there's wooden wheels on cars still, which is kind of nuts. Um, <laughs> We have maps in our archives that show Indian Canyon Golf Course development being planned, and this road was there prior to that golf course having been improved, to kind of give you a general sense of when this was happening. Um, it does bisect all city park property, whether it's in the county or the city. We own the natural land on one side and the golf course on the other. Um, and all of the road improvements are in the county, and that's important because the city roads department maintains roads in the city, and the county maintains them in the county. So that's kind of a weird um, no man's land, so to speak, for where this road is located. At no point since the 1930s that we can find has the Parks Department ever done anything with this road. It's been treated generally like all of our other roads in the community. Um, so we don't, as a matter of fact, maintain any public roads. There's a few public, uh, private roads in Manitou Park and some other locations where we do a little bit of maintenance. You know, think of the loop drive that are, we're having the holiday lights on. That's one of our roads, but the public roads in the city are maintained by the streets department. Um, so Canyon Drive is, why are we talking about it? It's at the end of its life, it's falling apart, <clears throat> and nobody's taking care of it in a proper manner. And so um, we're looking for a way to, to get it taken care of. So the road was closed, and what we learned was that the county doesn't have the tools they need to take care of this because it's not technically a public road for them. On a map, it shows up like a private drive. It shows up like your driveway. It doesn't show up as a public right-of-way. So it really needs to be dedicated to the right entity. So what does that mean? What is what is dedication? Dedication really is the conveyance of private land to a public use, for a, for a public use. It's weird to think about the city land being considered private land, but when you think about city parks, that really is treated like, in many cases, city or private property. Um, it's not dedicated for a specific public use outside of parks when it's being used as a public road. And so in order for it to be treated like a public road, it needs to be dedicated to that use. That would allow a municipality, the streets department, the roads department, to do what they do best and take care of these facilities. But until that happens, they don't have the, uh, the ability to apply their funding mechanisms even if they wanted to. 
So the effect of this resolution is really, this is asking the park board to authorize the start of the dedication process. That is asking the parks board to say, yes, we recognize that this should be a road and we would support mm. that process happening. That won't result in any physical change to what's there today. Eventually, if it's dedicated and approved in the county or city or whoever takes over, that could authorize and result in improvements to the road. But that's not what the resolution is really saying. The resolution is really saying um, we want to go through that process. So the physical change comes later. And that authorizes us as city staff to then apply, petition the county to make that dedication. So that's what we're asking for today. Um, that process is all yet to come over the next couple of months. And hopefully by spring, we can get in a position where the city, the county, the parks department, all of us understand who's actually maintaining what and that it's being used in the appropriate manner. Mm -hmm. Any questions? Um, so we go through the dedication process. It becomes used uh, for the public. Do you have um, a guess as to whether it would be um, rebuilt or repaired by the city or the county? So th we're having active discussions about that and what those scenarios would be. There are several scenarios, um, Councilman, that that could be rebuilt in sort of a grind and overlay sort of a process. It could be a full rebuild that might be a few years away. We've got some scenarios, but ultimately that's gonna require county partnership. And so at this time, we don't have great confidence in knowing when that rebuild might happen. What we want to get to is, hey, are we willing to take responsibility for it, and then we'll work together. Yeah, and have we talked to the county about this particular this resolution? Road? Yeah, yeah. So we've actually been meeting city streets director, uh, the parks director, park staff, and park, uh, Kyle Tuig, public works staff, have been meeting for the last couple of months discussing this. Actually, before winter. Um, and saying, hey, wh what do we do here? So we made this resolution available to the county. The county's actually had some input here, and so they're aware. Awesome, and then do we know if it can be repaired or is it gonna be a rebuild? It's, it's a rebuild. Yeah. Um, it's probably not a city street rebuild. According to the county, there's a different set of standards for those types of roads, but it's a full, full rebuild most likely. Nice, and I guess, sorry, one last question. Do we know how quickly we could get it into the six-year plan for the roads? That I don't know. Okay. We can follow up with that information if we move through this process, okay. yeah. Good questions, council yes. member, thank mm -hmm. you. Any other questions? Well, I think um, at Finance 2, didn't we talk about the thoughts even about a trail? Yeah, you perhaps. Know, it, it, perhaps that type of thing as well. So there's more than one item out there right. that we're kind of conjuring, if you will, figure that one out. But again, yeah, and I think the important thing on when we talk about what's the use of this road is that we know it how it's been used for 90 years. And so we assume at this point that it's going to continue to be used in the same manner it was. Mm -hmm. And so that's really why we're going through this dedication process. So we're not at this moment rethinking what that use would be. We're saying, you know, let's, let's assume it's gonna continue to be a road and then through the dedication process, we'll learn if something needs to change. And Nick, it is the main road for the maintenance staff to work mm -hmm. at, at Indian Canyon too, correct? It's the road they use to get to their job, yeah. Yeah. Mm. Okay. Sorry, that brings up another question. So then as this is getting rebuilt, how would the maintenance staff get to their um, <laughs> That's a fantastic question. One of, I don't know the answer to. Again, I think that's Helicopter. a helicopter. Yeah, we'll, we'll. I like it. Maybe I a like slide it. down the, the number one fairway. Yeah. Uh, no, that's something we would have to work through. And I think that's pretty common for public work staff to kind of help figure out how does something get rebuilt when we get people to their business. Cool. Yeah. yeah. Any further questions? All right, Mr. Anderson, would you like to make a motion? Most certainly. And, and now you can see why we wanted Nick to uh, go over this again with yes. everyone. So if no further questions, I will move to adopt the resolution dedicated for West Canyon Drive to be dedicated as a public roadway. Is there a second? I'll second. Great, Kevin. Okay, any other comments, questions? If not, we'll put I, it. I just had one comment. I, I understand that we have checked with the Friends of the Palisades. Uh, we have. And they are in favor. We have checked with the Friends of Palisades. I should have said this earlier. I apologize. <laughs> um, we have asked, you know, any the golf course, the Friends of Palisades, anybody who uses this road regularly and said, hey, you know, are you supportive of this? And the answer we've heard is anything that helps improve this road because it's terrible. 
um, we're supportive of that. Great. And you also checked with city legal to make sure it's a legal process. <laughs> we did. And one of the things I learned was that actually when we dedicate roadways and right of way, oftentimes we still retain ownership of that property. Really, the municipality has an easement from us to maintain that, and they have rights that come with that, but it still remains the property of the city. And so um, per that, we have no issues with the charter. So we, yes, we can dedicate this road. One more question. That's it. Um, so as we're rebuilding this, you said a couple thousand people a day use this for their regular commute. So they're going to have to use something else. How is that going to affect the surrounding areas? So what we've heard is that there is a decent route around this, which is government way. Mm -hmm. So it may affect somebody's commute time, but really you're going down Sunset Highway and instead of cutting up assembly and across and through, you're able to go government way and then, and then around that way. And then Greenwood would remain open. So really um, the commute levels are such that it can be managed with a detour on another city arterial. Cool. Mm. All right, any other questions, comments? If not, there is a second in motion. So all those in favor, respond by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Well, Nick, you have yourself a dedication. Thank you very much. Well, <laughs> the intent today. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Nick, for the presentation. Okay. First step. And Mr. Anderson, while you have the floor, how about the Development and Volunteer Committee? Well, I still have to talk about Mark Bunig. Oh, that's right. That's all right. And Mark Bunig prevented the no November financials, which continue to follow the trend of revenues and expenditures increasing over 2021. Through November, Riverfront Park and golf revenue growth has exceeded expenditure increases, resulting in positive income generation, despite the substantial increases in salaries and wages. Mark reviewed specific 2022 expenditures, highlighted by a $205,000 decrease in water expenses when compared to last year. The new irrigation systems at three of our golf courses and continued diligence from the parks team are primarily responsible for these water savings. The next Finance Committee will be Tuesday, January 10th at 3 p.m. and also in a hybrid format. The DVC met Wednesday, November 16th at 3 p.m. Garrett presented the progress update that you saw today, so I won't go over any of that. Fiona Dixon presented the quarterly volunteer report, and Fiona also presented a draft policy and procedure for Adopt-a-Park and Park Friends. This policy provides direction, expectations, and support for community involvement in parks, including three levels, volunteer, adopt a park, and friends of groups. The next DVC meeting will be Wednesday, December 21st at 3 p.m., and also in hybrid format. And the DVCAC met Thursday, November 17th at 4 p.m. in hybrid format. Chair Kelly Brown usually provides a recaps of these meetings, but she's found something else to do for the next few days at, at Manitou Park. So I, I will <laughs> do a brief recap in Kelly's absence. Fiona Dixon presented the same draft policy for Adopt a Park and Friends of Groups, so I won't go over that again. And Kelly asked the members to share recent successes and introduce some upcoming events. Lee Williams from the Friends of Coeur d'Alene Park spoke of their Hall Halloween spook walk. She said that earned them $4,000. Oh, yes. Future events include an art fest in June of 2023 and their summer concert series for later in, in the summer. Trevor Finchamp from Friends of the Bluff, he focused on planning and preparing for post-winter activities, including new trail maps. Their first 2023 events will start in June. Cole Taylor from Friends of Riverfront Park discussed their efforts to develop a website for their friends group. Trevor Finchamp provided some recommendations for him. And Kelly Brown from the Friends of Manitos, she provided an update on the holiday light show. Three group members have their first terms expiring in February. And one of those included Kelly as the, as the interim chair, but there was a motion to extend that her chair for another year, and she will go through January 2024. A purpose of the CAC is to provide access to the park board th through the DVC. 
Members are encouraged to develop presentations highlighting their activities and their requests for increased park support. The attending members were working on their presentations with plans to bring to the CAC in 2023. And from a park board member's perspective, it's been rewarding to see the growth of the CAC. Its original vision of getting community groups working together with parks to enhance not only their own group's efforts, but to strengthen the community as a whole has been championed by the original members. The efforts of Chair Kelly Brown have been essential to the group's evolution, and it will be exciting to see the group's growth in 2023. The next DVC meeting is scheduled for Thursday, January 26th, 2023, in hybrid format. Thank you, Bob. That's a very nice segue into the fact that Holiday Lights does open this weekend, and tonight the Park Board is invited to have a preview drive-through. You'll be the uh, test case uh, from 5 to 7, if you can make it up there. So, of course, I know it depends on the snow a bit, but there we are. So, uh, where, is that, where is that at again? Uh, so, Manitou Park. I believe the entrance is at the same place, is it yeah. not? So, Just it's by the perennial gardens, by the old arch uh, rock bridge, and so that'll be the entry point in yeah. about a half-mile loop. Yeah, so usually you access it if you go down Tico right. and then turn left there by the park bench and then you'll see the arch off to the right and that begins your loop through. Because they also enter from Grand. So, yeah. So, okay, yeah. so my president's report is short. Merry Christmas, everyone, <laughs> and happy holidays. Thank you for coming today. It's wonderful to have you here. Um, I know, Nick, you'll make it when you can, and I wish Sally uh, good wishes on getting over her bug that she has. Um, the other thing is that in January, I will be officially appointing the nominating committee for your next officers. You can serve on that committee even if you wish to be an officer or you think you'll be asked to be an officer, um, and so be thinking about that. And we'll move right into conservation futures. Nick Sumner. Anything for conservation I, futures? Uh, no updates this month for conservation future. But I will definitely be there next month. Excellent. Yeah. Excellent. Parks Foundation, Barbara G. I am so excited to report that we met last night at the Bark um, nice. Pub Rescue Restaurant. And it was their end of the year budget and uh, term uh, expiration as well as their slate of officers. So I'm happy to report their total revenue for 2023 will be $480,000, 200 or $480,000, 200 cents. That's what they said. I don't, I don't know what that means, but um, <laughs> your fund balance report is in your packet just in case you're questioning that number. Um, their budget for the 2023 grant allowance, so they have um, entities in the in the community that uh, apply for grants, is is uh, increased by 10,000. So they have up to $60,000 to give now in grants, which is super exciting for the community to know that they can access those funds. Also, Marta Deffenbach, who's their treasurer, is termed out, so they're bringing on. Jean Fitzpatrick from Spokane City uh, Credit Union to be their treasurer. So that's really an exciting move and he, he'll be a new board member as well. Craig Anderson, Amy Lutz, and Ted McGregor will remain on the board as they renew their board positions. And those positions are for three years. You'll be glad to know that Kevin Hennessy is their new president beginning in January. And Wade uh, Shirtleney, I'm sorry if I pronounced, mispronounced his name, is president-elect. And then obviously Amy Lutz will be past chair. So super exciting there. Uh, and their next meeting, as you know, they don't meet monthly anymore. So that's kind of exciting that I get a night off, will be Wednesday, February 22nd from 4.30 to 5.30. Thank you, Barb. Thank you. And it's so nice to have Councilmember Bingle with us in person so he can give a report. Uh, yeah, so uh, it's the end of the year for us, and so we're going to be updating our committees. Um, I do intend to keep this one. Uh, I'm on a lot of hard committees. This is the more fun one that I'm on, and so I uh, <laughs> want to keep that one. Uh, take that, libraries. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Um, but uh, it, right now we're, we're, I mean, right in the throes of budget season, approving the budget, and so uh, we've been working on that. And one of the things I've asked the CFO for is, um, is an analysis of uh, what the parks budget would look like if we received 
8% funding of the entire budget as opposed to just the general fund budget. Now, don't get too excited because <laughs> it's, 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 it's a really, yeah. <laughs> but, you know, I, I, I've talked to, uh, to Garrett about this, you know, about the intention right. of that charter amendment in the 70s when it happened uh, was, was intended to do that. And as things keep getting peeled back, obviously, that means less and less you know, money for the parks to, to keep our parks great. And, you know, the district I represent, the Northeast, we don't have any major parks. Uh, we have um, uh, a lot of neighborhood parks. And if we would like to see a, a major neighborhood park up in the, in the Northeast, it's gonna require a significant amount of money. Mm -hmm. um, and so how do, we, how do we make that happen? Um, the uh, American Indian Cultural Center, I know that uh, parks has been looking into that. And so uh, trying to keep my uh, my feelers on that to see uh, how that's going along. We are asking uh, the state legislature to give us uh, quite a bit of money for that. Um, everybody on council is excited for the 50th reunion of Expo 74. We even played a, a, a video of the opening ceremonies uh, last week at our uh, at our council meeting, and it was a, it was a lot of fun. We all really enjoyed it, um, and we did remove the uh, the King Cole Bridge ask from the parks department from our tier one uh, legislative asks because we heard that uh, uh, that that was going to be privately funded and I just want to double check that that is correct that is correct perfect and uh, I think that's uh, that's my update for us great yeah well we appreciate your impetus and your energy for parks and your heart for parks yes. thank you very much and we would love to get up there and and do more in districts one and three mm -hmm. um, again like yeah, you say it just sure. takes the money but the will is there. All right, Mr. Jones. All righty, well, <laughs> nice seeing everyone. I just wanna thank the park board and staff for, gosh, another, another great year um, in, for 2022. And I just wanna highlight a couple projects and also recognize um, some of our key staff of, of our park family that made all of this happen. And in the first piece that I really wanna to touch on is in 2022, approximately seven million dollars of non-parks department funding was invested in parks capital projects. That's three and a half times more than what we on an annual basis put into our capital program. Mm -hmm. And a lot of this came you know, through our city council ARPA um, program. And you know, I'm, I'm happy to say you know, one of the first approvals was the Don Cardong Bridge and we're just about ready to make an announcement when that's going to be open and so I, it might be one of the first checks to have a complete project as well off that ARPA list. You know, with the VISTA, uh, the County Conservation Futures Program, city utilities, and then also some private funding too. And I just wanna, you know, touch on some of those milestones <clears throat> this year. And I think that, you know, a big one is the, of course, the adoption of our Parks and Natural Land Master Plan. Mm -hmm. This is a huge endeavor that hasn't been done in the last decade mm -hmm. and <clears throat> that took a lot of time, commitment from staff, our community members, our park board, our city council to make that happen. Uh, Downriver Golf Course Project completed this year, um, just over 20 million gallons, 40% saved already year one. Uh, Dwight Merkel Sports Field Renovation, uh, we, we saw the end of life. It was deteriorating faster than we thought, and within five months, we had a financial plan and a replacement plan, and it was complete. Uh, the Palisade Park Rimrock to Riverside expansion, the Red Wagon renovation, the Riverfront North Suspension Bridge completed and reopened, the Don Cardong Bridge renovation, uh, a Vista Park, Upriver Park project, the Seeking Place, art installation at Riverfront, uh, and free and affordable programming all year round at Riverfront Park, uh, the Seek and Parks Foundation grants for youth recreation programs, uh, community center and outdoor uh, program partnership for outdoor recreation through our SEEK funding, uh, our youth gang intervention summer pilot program that we did this year that had huge success, um, the Spokane Bee tree planting and education, that program continues to grow after a tragedy <laughs> like our windstorm in 2021 with that added partnership that we had with uh, the, the Lands Council and our, our staff in being able to grow that, that program. The Pacific Education Institute and on-track partnership, so the tree seedling giving, giveaway, symposium, tree planting and education program, uh, the Manitou Park Mirror Pond Swan sculpture, mm -hmm. um, and then also 
the Manitou Holiday Lights coming up, the Arbor Day celebration, and the Fall Leaf celebration as well. And so how did we all make this possible? And I just want to thank the Park Board for your leadership, guidance, and also the trust and staff uh, to be able to implement projects, look at ideas, come up with some crazy ideas, and, be, and have the confidence that we can come to you and, and, and you know, throw something on the wall, see if it sticks, and, and continue to move forward and improve our community. And then also our wonderful staff, from our, our support staff to the men and women that are boots on the ground every day. But I also would just like to, um, a special thanks to our management team. This is our, really our core family. This is where a lot of the problem solving, the innovation happens. So, you know, within park operations, that's Al Vordabrugen, Angel Spell, Carl Strong, and Katie Kosenke. In recreation, that's Jen Papich, uh, Ryan Griffith, and Mark Poyer. And in Riverfront, that's John Moog, Amy Lindsay, and Kevin Shari. And then in finance, Mark Buning. And then in admin, Jason Conley, Fiona Dixon, and Nick Hammond. Cannot thank that core family group enough on another successful year. So as a small token of our gratitude, in front of you, you have a poinsettia from our homegrown Manitou Park. So our staff started from a seed, propagated it, and so it, you will not find a better poinsettia Best in this community so uh, that came from our park staff. And so I want to wish everyone a Merry Christmas, Happy New Year, and thank you again and looking forward to many more. Yes, indeed. Mm -hmm. And so thank with that, um, I think that a round of applause for our staff. <laughs> Frankly, you make us look good. You really do. So um, if there's nothing else, I will adjourn the meeting at 427. An early meeting is also a Christmas present. So happy holidays, everyone. And just make sure when you go outside, you keep the bag on the yes, poinsettia because yes. they're very sensitive. And I don't want it wilting on you before you get home. All right? Yes. <laughs> Thank you, guys. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Thank you.